tonight, a massive privacy breach of data that could not be more private. I'm just really shocked. Health card numbers, even lab results stolen with millions at risk. This has been a total sham. On the eve of a historic impeachment vote, Donald Trump lashes out. Why your grocery bill is growing faster than your paycheck. Get in motion. And Jane Fonda moved to Washington to get arrested. Don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> Just keep going. Her fight against climate change. This is The National. It is hard to imagine information more personal, more intimate than your medical records. But last month, that very private data of 15 million Canadians in BC and Ontario was stolen. Hackers attacked medical testing giant Life Labs and then held the information for ransom. Salima Shivji explains what it means for you. Louise Kilby came in for blood tests. She's leaving in shock. Like, frankly, I'm just astounded. It is worrisome because I don't know what they're going to do with the data. She could be one of the millions affected by the massive data breach at one of the country's largest medical services companies. Hackers got into the Life Lab system in late October, stealing the medical test results of 85,000 Ontarians and the personal information, names, passwords, health card numbers of millions more. I'm just really shocked. <laughs> because all my information is in there. It is a concern, but I don't know what we can do about it. You know, even the best security systems are not able to protect the data. We just have to spend a lot more money on cybersecurity. Life Labs did pay an unspecified ransom to get the medical information back. A tough decision, says the CEO, bartering with cyber criminals who hold all the power. While there's no guarantee, it seemed in our customers' best interest, I think that's what they wanted us to do, to reach out and get the data back and try and secure it. And so that's what we did. And today he's promising that the company's cyber defences have been shored up, that the risk to customers is low. We're sorry this happened. We may have shaken their confidence and we're going to do everything we can to win that back. Hackers are increasingly going after healthcare files with their large trove of personal info, but it's also the most personal of attacks. Genetic information is becoming more and more valuable. If that was attached to your e-health record, there's now a genetic modifier, uh, a genetic record of you, pardon me, that's now out there in the wild, which I think for me is probably one of the most invasive breaches of privacy. As police investigate, Life Labs has set up a hotline for customers and is offering free identity theft insurance for a year. Cold comfort for many. It makes me feel uncomfortable, but it also makes me feel like, what can I do about it? Question many are asking as they wait to see if their files are affected. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Vancouver. History is expected to be made tomorrow in Washington. And tonight, Americans who want Donald Trump impeached are making their voices heard. More than 600 pro-impeachment rallies were organized from Times Square to Doral, Florida, outside Trump's estate. Those people will be watching that vote in the U.S. House of Representatives very closely. But even on this day, true to form, Trump was hitting back hard. As Paul Hunter tells us, he attacked both the Speaker of the House and the entire impeachment process. Look, it's a uh, hoax. The whole impeachment thing is a hoax. From the very get-go, Donald Trump has made his view clear. This has been a, uh, a total sham from the beginning. Everybody knows it. And at about the time he said that in the Oval Office today, the White House released this. A letter from Trump to Democratic Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, fully six pages long, repeatedly slamming her and the impeachment process, calling it a libelous, vicious, partisan crusade. It's spiteful, he says, disingenuous, meritless, baseless. Pelosi, he writes, has hatred for Trump, and he compares the whole thing to the Salem witch trials of the 1600s. It's ridiculous. Said Pelosi tonight, the letter is ridiculous, really sick. The president's continuing course of conduct constitutes a clear and present danger to democracy in America. Democrats and Republicans, meanwhile, spent the day debating rules for tomorrow's expected vote. 
Unsurprisingly, partisan positioning dominated. Sadly, the Democrats' impeachment inquiry has been flawed and partisan from day one. But with Democrats controlling this stage of the process, no one doubts tomorrow's outcome that Trump will be impeached. And so other lawmakers are already working toward the next stage, the trial in the Senate in January, where Republicans who control the Senate are ultimately expected to vote to keep Trump in office. On that today, yet more partisan battling. Republicans downplayed the evidence. House Democrats slapdash impeachment inquiry has failed to come anywhere near, anywhere near the bar for impeaching a duly elected president. While Democrats pressed for the right to call White House witnesses. What is President Trump afraid of? The truth? All right, so the big day is tomorrow. Paul, walk us through, if you can, how it's expected to play out. Indeed, you know, after all this time, it's impeachment day. Uh, there is some suggestion tonight that the vote in the House of Representatives may happen as early as late afternoon or dinner time, with by then lawmakers having had the time to debate yet again the merits of the allegations. But, and we've said this often, the outcome isn't really in doubt. The broad expectation is he will be impeached. It's worth noting, even Trump himself seems resigned to it at this point, albeit evidently enraged. At the end of that six-page letter, after all the attacks on the process and on Nancy Pelosi herself, Trump says, I write this to you for the purpose of history and to put my thoughts on a permanent and indelible record so that it can never happen to another president again. In other words, Adrian, he knows what's coming. All right, Paul, we will see you and talk tomorrow. Indeed. And when those votes are cast tomorrow, we'll make sure you've got the inside track. I'll be hosting The National from Washington. We'll have complete coverage of what happens and what it means. Our U.S. political insiders will be standing by to guide you through the politics and to see what the future could hold for Donald Trump and our neighbours to the south. Today, a former Trump campaign advisor received a light sentence for some pretty serious crimes. Rick Gates will only spend 45 days in jail and pay a $20,000 fine for doing what could have brought him years in prison. Last year, he admitted to laundering millions in lobbying fees from Ukraine for his longtime boss, Paul Manafort, who ran Trump's campaign. And he admitted lying to the FBI. The judge was lenient because Gates had turned on Trump, giving valuable information to Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. And turning to the politics in this country, Rosie, a whole lot of pressure on Bill Morneau, it seems, to spend some money today. That's, yeah, that's right, Adrian. It's what tends to happen, in fact, when the federal finance minister sits down with his provincial counterparts. And Morneau sounded today open to ideas on getting much-needed money out the door after today's finance minister's meeting, especially to Canada's struggling oil patch. But so far, the checkbook remains closed. David Cochran explains. <laughs> There's a lot of small talk at these meetings, but when it's the finance ministers, even the small talk is about big money. We are, are very much hoping that we get a good sense of the issues and challenges facing, uh, facing us around the, uh, around the country. Those issues and challenges add up to billions in shortfalls for the three oil-reliant provinces. So the provinces and territories came to this meeting with a united demand for federal help through reform of the fiscal stabilization program. I don't think anyone would argue that, uh, that Alberta and Saskatchewan and Newfoundland and Labrador aren't going through difficult financial times. The program hasn't been changed in decades and the provinces want it to become more generous and easier to qualify for. It has to be more responsive to uh, a quick downturn in the economy. The proposed reforms are worth hundreds of millions for Newfoundland and Labrador. I get a, a sense from the uh, federal minister that they're open to our proposal. Uh, they're going to review it and uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very confident that we'll see some result. They are worth billions to Alberta. But, you know, time will tell. Uh, I can't uh, overemphasize the fact that uh, timing's important here. Uh, certainly uh, within Alberta, there's, uh, there, there's a sense of alienation out west. So they made their case and got positive words, but no firm decision, at least not yet. I committed to getting uh, officials working on this right away. 
I've asked, I'm going to ask task officials with the analysis. Uh, I'm going to task them with getting back with a timeline and a process for uh, next steps in January. So more talk, more reviews with billions at stake. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. So you've heard a lot about that fiscal stabilization fund. It's hard to say that David mentioned in his story, but what is it? It's meant to help provinces out of unexpected economic problems or if their resource revenues decline by more than 50 percent. But it's for emergencies, not to correct bad policy. In the last few years, Alberta, Saskatchewan and Newfoundland and Labrador have all received money. The most a province can get is 60 bucks per person. So in 2016, for example, Alberta got the maximum 250 or so million dollars. Alberta now wants that cap to be lifted and for Ottawa to backdate the payments to 2014 when the oil downturn first gripped the province. That would mean another two and a half billion dollars for the province. You'll hear a lot more about that in the coming weeks. That's it for uh, us in Ottawa tonight. Let's head back to Adrian in Toronto. All right, Rosie, the victims of last year's mass shooting on the Danforth in Toronto want some accountability. As we reported last night, they have filed a lawsuit against the U.S. gun maker. They're arguing smart technology could have stopped the shooter. But as Jacqueline Hansen explains, this is new legal territory. Never forget it. Ken Price's sure. daughter, Samantha, we was injured in the Danforth shooting. A bullet went through her hip. The gunman, Faisal Hussein, shot her and 14 others with a stolen semi-automatic pistol. Two of the young girls who were shot died. Now Price is part of a lawsuit that aims to hold the gun maker accountable. In a statement of claim filed in the Ontario Superior Court, six plaintiffs allege Smith & Wesson was negligent because the company failed to incorporate smart gun technology. It could have prevented this. Smart guns are designed to limit who can operate them. Germany's Armatix created a system that requires the user to wear a special transmitting watch. If not, the gun won't fire. Boston-based BioFire's design requires the owner's fingerprint. According to the proposed lawsuit, Smith & Wesson agreed to incorporate smart technology in the early 2000s, but didn't follow through. Acknowledging that a number of firearms were being stolen and that action should be taken, but then was not taken. Oh, that's this thing here? Yeah. Okay. But some gun owners aren't convinced smart guns are the solution. It's certainly not a technology that's in widespread use in Canada. This is how typically how Canadians store restricted firearms like handguns. This gun rights advocate says uh, laws in Canada that require firearms. gun owners to store firearms safely already prevent legal guns from getting into the wrong hands. In the U.S., gun manufacturers are shielded from these types of lawsuits. That's not the case in Canada. Here. The bar is lower, but we, we still don't like to hold gun manufacturers responsible in that way, but we should. The Danforth plaintiffs are seeking $150 million in damages. If they can hurt them on the bottom line and collect a large settlement, uh, it may actually force change in how gun manufacturers go about their business. I mean, there and that's the what Price and the other plaintiffs the are hoping for. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Fair compensation. Police in Ontario and Quebec say they have broken up a car theft ring that stole nearly 500 high-end vehicles, most from around Ottawa and the greater Toronto area. 20 Quebec residents now face 350 charges. Stu Mills looks into who was targeted and how it was done. Earlier this month, thieves drove off with Alan Lynn's forerunner in the middle of the night. The heist took just seconds. You never expect it to happen to you, and all of a sudden, one morning, we woke up and our car's missing. Today, police agencies from Toronto to Laval gathered to say they put a serious dent in a giant car theft ring. So far, 20 people are under arrest, all from Montreal, many already facing charges for similar crimes. They do not see the law as a barrier to their activities. These are commodity-specific criminals who repeat the same offences over and over again. Lexus SUVs, Toyota Highlanders and Forerunners were the clear favorites, but they also stole dozens of Ford pickup trucks from dealerships and homes. The two key groups that investigators have been focused on are persistent, methodical and deceitful. And proud. Police found this photograph on the wall of a Laval home they raided. 
Officers say they intercepted 97 vehicles headed for the port of Montreal to be shipped to Africa or the Middle East where they can sell for as much as twice the sticker price. Police say in all these cases, thieves weren't using a signal booster to extend the range of the fob as previously thought. They're breaking into the cars and using this port to access its computer, forcing the vehicle to accept a whole new key fob, usually in less than three minutes, and all with software that's totally legal. Police recovered Alan Lynn's stolen forerunner with the telltale signs of the door handle forced open. So many Toyotas have been stolen this way, mechanics can't get the parts to make the repair. They mentioned that uh, they can't give me an ETA on when the, uh, the vehicle will be uh, ready for me because uh, they're waiting on that exact part. Police recommend you consider an old-fashioned steering wheel lock, an upgrade for the factory security system, or just keep your car in a locked garage. Stu Mills, CBC News, Ottawa. Cannabis vaping products are now legally available across most of Canada, effective today, but not without controversy. With an outbreak of serious lung problems associated with vaping, some are questioning why Health Canada is allowing the sale of products it's not yet tested. Christine Birak looks into it. Up close, cannabis vape oil looks a lot like honey, but it's actually a potent mix of THC, the chemical that gets people high, diluted with additives and topped with flavorings to give it that taste and smell. Newly regulated cannabis oils are required to list all chemical ingredients inside and their amounts, but health experts say one major safety check is missing. We don't really understand that this is a different mode of delivery. When cannabis vape oils are heated or vaporized, they produce new chemicals. So what goes in isn't necessarily what comes out. Health Canada admits there has been no analysis done on those chemicals. That means that they'll be going into people's lungs before they're tested in a, in a vaping machine. We asked leading cannabis companies if they're testing emissions from their products. The answer was basically no. It's not something Health Canada required them to do. We work in partnership with Health Canada to meet or exceed all the safety regulations that they put out. But at least one company is holding back. Hexo acknowledges common chemicals found in cannabis vape oils are under scrutiny for having potential negative health impacts. It's testing different formulations in search of a safer product. American doctors are now treating hundreds of patients with vaping-related illnesses, many of them linked to an additive called vitamin E acetate. Given all the unknowns, doctors can't understand why Canada has rushed to legalize these products. I am surprised that they're allowing that to happen. I think that's where the jury's out as to how dangerous that can be. That's why some provinces have said, hang on a minute, let's wait at least until the U.S. CDC can finish their investigation so that we can have a better list of what should and shouldn't go in these oils. His advice? Until the science is settled, Canadians should consider sticking with dry, leafy cannabis. Christine Birak, CBC News, Waterloo, Ontario. Also, as of today, cannabis edibles are now legally available across most of Canada as well, but people in three of the largest provinces will have to wait a little longer. Cannabis-infused products from beverages to baked goods to gummy bears are now good to go everywhere. Except Alberta, Ontario and Quebec, which have their own distribution systems and some stricter regulations. Edibles in those provinces likely won't be available until mid-January at the earliest. And there's no guarantee providers elsewhere will be able to meet demand right away. Retailers from B.C. to Saskatchewan to Nova Scotia say they will be lucky to have stock by the weekend due to some supply chain issues. One likely exception, Newfoundland and Labrador, where cannabis producers can sell their products right on site. We're back in two minutes with more news. Canadians are spending a lot more money on food, but our incomes are not keeping up. And soccer star Christine Sinclair closes out the decade with another honor. That's next. Welcome back. If you think you're spending more of your hard-earned cash on food, you're right and you're not alone. A new survey suggests the vast majority of Canadians believe food costs are rising faster than their incomes. And as Cameron McIntosh reports, many people are making some tough choices as a result. 
picking up a few groceries, Bernadine Leckman is like most Canadians, always watching the prices. Big concern, of course. Um, people in all uh, walks of life, those of us who are retired, um, people who are still working with young families. Worries found in grocery aisles across the country, even at this small grocer who's focusing on local goods to cut down on transportation and handling costs. I think that many people are concerned about meeting their basic, uh, b their basic needs um, and we aren't seeing um, a huge uh, difference in the amounts of income that people are getting. 87% of Canadians surveyed by Angus Reid say they feel like food prices are increasing faster than household income. Anxiety is highest in Quebec and Alberta. We're not buying very much and we also don't eat out a lot anymore because it's extremely expensive to eat out, I find. Just trying to eat smarter, trying to plan our meals better as a family and uh, not have so much waste is probably the biggest thing. Common responses in the survey says co-author Sylvain Charlebois. Families that earn $80,000 or less uh, are likely more likely more vulnerable. He's forecasting food prices will rise between 2 and 4 percent in 2020, while average wages are projected to rise 2.7 percent. He expects consumers will look at meat prices first. So we may actually see uh, Canadians decide to uh, diversify their protein portfolio, if you will, by, uh, by trying or consuming more vegetable proteins. Lindy Bright knows all about being on the edge. She volunteers at and relies on the Winnipeg Harvest Food Bank. The number of people she helps daily is growing. We used to have 19, 25, 30, and the, the numbers are increasing. If the forecasts hold true, more families may find themselves making hard choices with their food budgets. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Among the other stories we're following tonight, the future of Nova Scotia's largest and controversial pulp mill is unclear this evening. The province says it can't yet deliver an environmental assessment. I'm aware of the implications this could have on people's lives and li livelihoods. But I have said from day one that this decision will be based on science and best available information. Today, the province was supposed to rule on a proposal for a new waste treatment facility for the mill. The mill has been pumping wastewater into a lagoon near an indigenous community, dividing many in the Maritimes. The existing facility must close by the end of January, which could affect thousands of jobs. The Assembly of First Nations National Chief was in New York today, urging the international community to protect indigenous cultures around the world. Our languages. They connect, connect us all through our ceremonies, to our lands and to our waters, to our right to self-determination as Indigenous peoples. That's Perry Bellegarde speaking to the UN General Assembly to mark the end of the International Year of Indigenous Languages. And Canadian soccer superstar Christine Sinclair has been named the Sports Player of the Decade. Among her many, many achievements, Sinclair has been named Canadian Soccer Player of the Year seven times. She's just one goal away from tying the women's world record total of 184. In presenting her the honour, Canada Soccer called her a once-in-a-generation athlete. When we come back, a look at the takeover battle for Hudson's Bay Company. And that could mean changes at your local Bay store. And a Hollywood icon takes center stage in the climate change movement. We spend the day with Jane Fonda. This time of year, it may not seem like Hudson's Bay is struggling, but there is a battle going on in the executive suites over who can turn the company's fortunes around. An American investor wants to buy it and take it private, while a Canadian investor wants to stop that from happening. Diane Buckner now on what it could mean for your local Bay store. The annual holiday windows at the Bay. Lots of happy faces on display too. But behind the scenes, HBC management isn't so cheery. The chain and its stores are far bigger than what makes sense in today's retail environment. I think if they could snap their fingers and say we had half the number of stores and all of them were three quarters of the size or half the size, I think they'd be doing great. The Bay announced a $226 million loss this quarter. Its stock price has been falling for five years. On the count of 
HBC executive chairman, New York real estate mogul Richard Baker, was bubbling with enthusiasm in 2016 when he opened the first Saks Fifth Avenue location in Canada as part of HBC. All that we're doing is creating the type of retail that Canadians have wanted all along. This fall, Baker's team offered to buy all HBC shares he doesn't already own for $10.30 apiece. Then came an offer of $11 from Toronto's Catalyst Capital. Baker said no, he's not selling. The two groups lodged complaints against each other with the regulator, both alleging misbehavior. But why is anyone battling to own a struggling retailer? Downtown Vancouver uh, is, a, is a great location, holds a lot of value, uh, similarly downtown Montreal. Commercial real estate broker Tim Sanderson says HBC's properties are worth a fortune. Its Saks Fifth Avenue location in Manhattan alone is valued at $2 billion. It's New York, it's the you know financial capital of the world. No wonder Richard Baker wants to own it all. Plus, a private enterprise can be easier to turn around than a public one. When companies are going through change, it is a freedom to be able to do the right thing for the business long term and invest as needed without having to report to public shareholders every quarter. Already, HBC has been downsizing. Home Outfitters has been shut down. Lord & Taylor and a European retailer it owned have been sold. Could your local Bay store be next? I think you'd have to guess that they would want to shrink the number of stores and shrink the footprint. I think anything that's going to be sold, disposed of, closed, lease terminated is going to be in, in second or third tier markets, smaller markets. The Bay is still a beloved Canadian brand to many, but whoever owns it will need to make some big moves if its holiday traditions are to continue past its 350th birthday next year. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, Jane Fonda on what she brings to the fight against climate change. I bring celebrity, and that's very important. You wouldn't be here interviewing me if I wasn't a celebrity. Welcome back to International News Now, where tensions have erupted in France over pension reforms. In Paris, officers in riot gear lined both sides of the streets and fired tear gas at protesters. Police say these clashes involve the Black Bloc Anarchist Group. That's the same group caught up in confrontations in the western city of Nantes. But other protests in that city were peaceful. These demonstrations, all part of a series of actions, massive actions across the country today, aimed at bringing momentum to the general strike nearly two weeks after it began. And the Vatican is changing how the Catholic Church deals with sexual abuse cases involving children. Pope Francis announced he's getting rid of something called the pontifical secret. That's a confidentiality rule used by some churches to avoid cooperation with police investigations. The policy change will also make it easier for victims to get information about their cases at the Vatican. The Pope is also tightening pornography rules. Now, sensitive images of people under the age of 18 could be considered child pornography before the age was 14. And Pakistan's former president has been sentenced to death in a treason case. The country's former military leader, Pervez Musharraf, was sentenced over his 2007 imposition of emergency rule. The penalty, though, is unlikely to be carried out. Musharraf is currently in self-imposed exile in Dubai. This marks the first time in Pakistan's history that a military leader has been held accountable for his actions while in power. And two massive paintings by a Canadian Cree artist will be front and centre at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. To be commissioned here uh, by the Met is a huge moment for me. I think it would be an incredible moment for any artist because the Met is one of the most important museums in the world. As visitors pass through the main entrance of the historic museum, they will be greeted by the work of Kent Monkman, a Fisher, a Fisher River First Nations artist looking to challenge the historical depictions of Indigenous peoples. The paintings will hang in the Met's Great Hall until April of next year. Jane Fonda believes in the power of protests. It's why she moved to Washington this fall to demand action on climate change. Of course, she's no stranger to adding her name to either a cause or a marquee.
It seems she's always been in the limelight, a woman of extremes, the starlet who would become an actor worthy of Oscars. She's been a fitness guru, political lightning rod, and vocal feminist, but always at her core, a Hollywood legend who knows the value of a close-up. Susan Ormerston caught up with Fonda in Washington to talk about her latest role, climate activist. Jane Fonda has always been, well, Jane, talented, passionate, opinionated, a successful actress and businesswoman for 50 years. On a Friday in Washington, she joins a jumble of people at a Lutheran church to marshal a march against climate change. Jane Fonda's an activist again. Y'all ready for today? Yeah. Yeah. Fonda has agreed we follow her on this so-called fire drill Friday. This city is consumed by the prospect of impeachment. Why are you here now? Because this is when I could come. I got the idea um, the beginning of September. Inspired by Greta Thunberg, I decided I needed to leave my comfort zone and put my body on the line and engage in civil disobedience and risk getting arrest because we need to step up with bolder actions now, it's a real crisis. Greta is a teenager, you're in another season of your life. What have you learned through your experience that helps in this type of cause? I'll tell you what I've learned. People who are organized can change policy. People who are together, unified, and organized around a strategic goal can change anything. Where's the front of the line? The group's not large at first, Concerned citizens, veteran rabble-rousers, peppered with a few notable faces, actresses Kira Sedgwick and Taylor Schilling. Annie Leibovitz, herself famous, is shooting the scene for Vogue magazine. All right, let's go, back up, guys, back up. Diversity on land and sea is under severe attack. Fonda's been out here every Friday since September. A classic style protest, march somewhere, target something important to the cause. She's been arrested four times here for civil disobedience and once carted off to jail overnight, part of the plot. It's quite an experience to know that you ha are powerless that you have been handcuffed and that you were completely in the control of the police. Now, because I'm white and famous, I'm not gonna be treated badly, I don't think. What did your jailers say to you? Um, they couldn't believe that I was there voluntarily. <laughs> and, um, it was dramatic because all night long, other people in their cells were banging on the walls and shaking their cell doors and just howls of despair were you in a cell by yourself? Yes, I was put in a cell by myself. A guard was put outside my door. That freaked me out more than anything. Who were they guarding me from? The only people that could get in were guards. You know, I mean, it's, you sleep on a metal slab. It's not pleasant. I mean, there are cynics. You've met them all your career and your life saying, oh, this is a celebrity stunt with a famous actress, you know, but really is this the type of pressure that will change anything? Yeah, well, I'm not alone. This is part of a movement. So what do you bring, Jane Fonda? I bring celebrity, and that's very important. You wouldn't be here interviewing me if I wasn't a celebrity. What does that do? Is it going to change policy? No, but it's going to wake people up. It inspires them, and it gives them a role model for what they can be doing. Today's target is BlackRock a big global investment company. A splinter group gets ahead to occupy the front of the DC offices. They've invested more than $90 billion in fossil fuels. Uh, and what do you want them to do? Divest. Divest. From the fossil fuel industry. If we have just 10 years to stop the climate crisis, and if we don't, we're all going down with them. We need a planet more than, we, than BlackRock needs their profits. Are you gonna try to go in? Uh, we're not sure yet. Police know they're coming. A downtown street is shut down. Watch out for the sidewalk right now. The crowd's growing larger now. 
Fonda is pushed to the middle and she takes up her post. At Standing Rock and Mauna Kea. But leaves room in front for the young activists. She takes her role seriously and with huge energy. The young people who all around the world by the tens of millions have bravely struck from school on Fridays and they've inspired us all folks to stand up with them. And I'm so grateful. Don't stop or we won't stop either. Thank you. If we continue to place our health and safety in the hands of utility executives. Fonda is no stranger to activism, woven through her career with protests from indigenous and women's rights. Silence is no longer an option. To the Iraq war and the Alberta oil sands. The eyes of the world are on this area. Keep that oil this Provoking controversy still today. Accept it, Jane. You failed with repeal 77, you're gonna fail with the Green New Deal. We don't need you here in DC. You know, look at this. This is Jane Fonda's mugshot from 1970. Back then, Fonda was a famous agitator in the anti-war movement, earning the nickname Hanoi Jane after she posed with the North Vietnamese. She later apologized. But in 1970, fresh from an anti-war speech in Canada, U.S. authorities pounced. You were arrested crossing the Canadian-U.S. border right. back in 1970? Arrest. Yes, that was my first. That what was, was that a, for? The police told me this. We are on orders from the White House to arrest me, seize all my records and my phone books and everything, and um, accuse me of smuggling drugs, which were actually vitamin pills. But they were pretty rough. The cops were, were rough, and it was orders from the White House. They wanted to stop your uh, Vietnam yeah. protests. Yeah. What did you learn from that experience? Because you were criticized as Hanoi Jane for some of that, and you apologized later in life. So you must have learned something from that that right. you took forward. Don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> Just keep going. You know, the more they attacked me, the more I dug in my heels. If they thought I was some, you know, s some soft, Hollywood starlet, daughter of Henry Fonda, and they could bully me. No, I, I wasn't going to let them get me. I just kept going. You still feel that way? Yeah. Only see now I'm old, and uh, so I feel even more capable of standing up. Wells Fargo, you must die back. The afternoon's getting long. Seven protesters have now locked themselves to the doors of Wells Fargo, a U.S. bank. They're chained to the bank. Um, yeah, you know, they can't use their hands, so uh, we're providing them with, with water and um, cough drops. And are they prepared to be arrested? Uh, that's up to them. What side are you on? What side are you on? Thank you so much. D.C. police are patient. Seems a small dose of civil disobedience will be tolerated this time. They know the drill, especially with Jane Fonda front and center. Shut it down! This way. Why are we going on the side of the street? How far is it? Back to Franklin. How far? She'll be back the next Friday and the next one till mid-January when she returns to Los Angeles to tape the next season of Grace and Frankie with comedian Lily Tomlin. That's my girl. What would Frankie say about Grace out on the streets? She'd say, go Grace! <laughs> She'd love it. She may join me. Grace with and Frankie do, <laughs> do jail. <laughs> White House, can you hear us? She's counting on one more night in jail. Maybe her birthday present. She turns 82 this Saturday. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Coming up on The National, a small community in Nova Scotia dealing with a very big problem, the threat of rising sea levels from climate change. That's next. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, as the third year of his presidency comes to an end, Donald Trump is all but certain to be impeached. But what comes next? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The impact of climate change is a fearful reality for Liverpool, Nova Scotia. 
The coastal community is desperate to ward off floodwaters that now come with growing frequency and force. As Tom Murphy shows us, it feels a lot like Liverpool is sinking. Okay, Liverpool has a problem, a big one, the ocean. Increasingly, it is consuming parts of this coastal town. Blame rising sea levels and stronger storms. It all means Water Street is, well, underwater. The Tourism Bureau becomes an island. Welcome to Liverpool. The bank sometimes has its own river bank. And at the Memories Cafe, they have bad dreams every time there's a storm in the forecast. How high will the water come? The water will come all the way up to where we make coffee. And what are you feeling when you see that? Panic. Here's the thing, you think it's bad now? Consider the recent findings of some scientific reports on climate change. They say sea levels could rise by two meters by the end of the year 2100 and by six meters before things begin to stabilize. At the very least, it gets you thinking, doesn't it? And that's what Liverpool is doing a lot of these days. The seawall and of course, once that breaches. David Bagley is the local mayor. You've got a real problem on your hands, don't you? Well, many locations in Nova Scotia have the same problem. Uh, we're dealing with it to the best of our ability and we're, we're hoping to do it right. Now, this town meddled with nature before and it actually made things worse. Up the street on higher ground at the town's museum, there's evidence of that. Well, I just wanted to show you something. This is a photograph from the uh, late um, 1800s showing what the waterfront used to look like. But those piers aren't there anymore. They infilled no, that area? they infilled it about in the early 1950s. Seemed like a good idea at the time, I yeah. guess. Well, it certainly created a lot of land, but it also created a problem. Like the problem of how to handle all that bulging water that now has less of a place to go. So how does Liverpool fix that? Okay, so put that on okay. and... Uh... That's where virtual reality technology comes in. So water levels are increasing. And oh, there goes, there's the bank, there's the cafe underwater. If nothing else, it's scaring people into action. Wow. There you're probably at about a three meter um, water level. Tim Webster heads up the geomatics research team at Nova Scotia Community College. I mean, many people are, are, are startled. Um, of course, people want to know, you know, where is my house? Uh, am I vulnerable? Um, you know, how, how bad can it get? And there's a double whammy here, something called subsidence, dating back to the Ice Age. Once that ice melted, uh, sea levels rose, of course, but actually we were, we're still subsiding. And uh, for example, Halifax, when we compare it to the center of the continent, we're, we're subsiding at about 16 centimeters a century. So we have relative sea level that's actually raising, rising higher than the global uh, numbers. So Liverpool is sinking. That's right, not just Liverpool, but essentially all of Nova Scotia. Back on the Liverpool waterfront, the community hired consultants. But here's the problem, the town can't afford to follow all their advice. And they range anywhere from building a proper seawall, uh, raising the parking lot, uh, demolishing buildings and relocating. It is the growing dilemma for coastal communities, because when it comes to sea level rise, things are gonna get worse before they get better. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Liverpool, Nova Scotia. When we come back, a special surprise for one Manitoba bead maker. When her handmade medallion showed up on daytime TV, that's our moment. So today was the second day. Whoopi Goldberg appeared on The View wearing this necklace. It's a jingle dancer in a red dress representing missing and murdered Indigenous women. So the artist who beaded it is from Sagkeen First Nation in Manitoba. She actually made it for a woman named Connie Grey Eyes. How the necklace ended up around Goldberg's neck is our moment of the day. Well, you're beautiful, my girl. We turn on the view, out comes Whoopi with my medallion on. We screamed, we jumped, I lost my voice. The necklace I'm wearing, it it's represents, beautiful. thank you, all Indigenous women who went missing on the Highway of Tears. This is how Whoopi got into the picture. Connie was at a conference. When she was talking to Whoopi, loving her up, hugging her, Whoopi kept staring at my medallion Connie was wearing. 
And in our culture, in our belief system, when you admire and love something like that, it's protocol to give it away. Yeah. None of us should be missing at all, you know? So this is my plea. I'm very grateful and honored that Connie gifted that to Whoopi, and now it's all going to a good cause, and I, I bet you I'm going to be beating till the pigs come home, flying home. <laughs> <laughs> so that is Mish Daniels, the bead, bead maker. Uh, her grandmothers were great bead makers as well. Uh, and part of this is being talked about in the United States because at the end of November, Donald Trump uh, set up a task force on missing and murdered indigenous women in the United States as well. That is a national for Tuesday, December 17th.